Hey, it's Tim Kawakami here, 49ers Plus Minus, with my co-host, Matt Barros. We're recording a couple hours after the final cut down to 53. There will be, shouldn't say final cut down. Jimmy Durkin will tiss tiss me for that. It is the cut down to 53. There will be adjustments. They've made some, clearly have some uh, moves where they're going to make uh, some injury list stuff. But I haven't read for the rare time. I have not read what Matt Barrows wrote. He just filed, just posted. He has not read what I wrote. It hasn't posted yet. So we don't know what's on each other's minds. Matt Barrows, just give me, you know, some high points. What are the things that struck you right off the bat from the four nerves cut to 53? Well, you just hit one of them that it's not uh, it's not a complete roster. There's it's obviously a work in progress. They're very light at uh, two important uh, <laughs> positions for them, tight end and offensive tackle and they're going to do some more moves um uh on wednesday it's not going to be that light entering the the jets game but it underscores something that we've been talking about um for weeks and weeks and months and months which is that they haven't been restocking those two positions very well and that's evident when you only keep two tight ends and you only keep two well, yeah, offensive but, tackles <laughs> how many how many tackles do you play at a time matt barrows uh, you only play two at a time, but, <laughs> but, but you, uh, like if one gets hurt, guys, then you have, you have zero, you have zero. It's like, wow. It's amazing. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. So the, the, those two, those two things stood out for me. The other thing that stands out is that this team is not good at drafting third round picks. And that's not just a, a Lynch Shanahan regime type thing. This goes back, you know, Balky wasn't good at it. Scott McLuhan largely wasn't good at it. I know that Frank Gore was in the third round. Uh, there's some notable exceptions there, but the third round, for some reason, is uh, is a tough round for these GMs, and that continued today with Cameron Latu, one of the tight ends we're talking about, uh, being cut, and and your guy Danny Gray also being cut. That was not a surprise. Latu maybe a mild surprise, but uh, following in the in the footsteps of uh, Trey Sermon and. Uh, Tyrion Ty, Ty uh, Davis, Davis Price. Price. Um, these are all third round picks in the last few years. Uh, uh, today, at least, none of them are on the roster. Yeah, my main thing, what I wrote about was the 2024 draft is already pretty good and, and verging towards very good. And they really, really needed it because 2021, 2022, 2023, with some rather large exceptions, obviously, Brock Purdy is the only major producer from the 22 draft. He's it. You, Spencer Burford, maybe, but he's not going to be a starter. And I think Pooney would have beat him out just straight up he's a better player i think um because they did not get i counted like total of six major producers on this roster from the entire 2021 22 and 23 drafts those are the guys that should be moving up in your roster becoming the mainstays replacing some of the high-end huge salary talent it's part of the squeeze of the 49ers of all this crowded top end talent they need kind of middle range talent that's moving. You know, Diamond Lenore is like one example of the one player of that group. Now he's about to get paid. He's because he's from 2021. They don't have that, and they desperately needed it from this draft. And Pony for sure. I don't know what they would be. Maybe they try to have to push Burford into that starting lineup if it wasn't for Pony. Jacob Cowing is their punt returner. You know, probably their fourth or fifth receiver. Ricky Pearsall. We'll see. Most of this is a you know evaluation not even based on Pearsall because we really haven't seen him. Renardo Green, I think, is a real shot to be their backup slot. Going to maybe see some time in, in any either corner spot. The fact that he's training at both positions shows you they think he's pretty advanced. Malik Mustafa is going to be a depth save. I think the secondary is deeper than I can remember it. Um, these are all guys that we can all picture playing, like playing on a good team. And if they didn't have them, this is both a praise of this draft and a condemnation. I think they've kind of turned the page on a lot of 21, 22, and 23 because you see lots who gone. You see Danny Gray gone. How, long, how much longer are you they're going to hang on to Danny Gray for one catch and one carry in his entire career? Yeah, um, that's, that's almost AJ Jenkins. Uh, yes. Other than not being a first round pick, but yeah, just a disaster, you know, just clogging up the roster. Um, so I wrote about that. It's just the volume of it, it was very important. And I do think. Uh, the 49er executive team would not mind me mentioning that's the first draft after losing Adam Peters. Not a diss on Adam Peters. It's just they did not like the talk. Oh, my God, what are they going to do without Adam Peters? Because he ran the draft for all those years. 
um, a little sensitive to that. And I think they show that they can flourish without Adam Peters. Now we'll see with Pearsall. If he's a bust, that kind of changes the tone of this, but we don't know that yet. Uh, he was the first round pick, but just led by Pony Green, um, you know, you cowing, you can see that this is, these are guys that this roster desperately needed. And it happened when, you know, exactly when they needed it. My other one is, you know, they go seven receivers. They usually go six. They really didn't need Ronnie Bell if the receiving core is healthy and all in. Kind of a sense of <laughs> obviously Pierce Holder they can't count on. And Brandon Ayuk, I don't think there's a sign that they think this thing's going to happen right away. Maybe it can be. All it takes is one phone call. But it does seem like they're kind of giving them insurance against Brandon Ayuk either not reporting for game, not playing in the game, or signing and then not being ready for game one. I agree with everything you said. Um, your point about the sort of the, the middle picks not uh, being good in recent years, that's why the, the bulky era team died. Yep. Um, it, it had some really high-end talent at the very top of it when he took over, um, but it sort of rotted from the inside. They didn't have a rank and file. The, the, the bulky issue was that he uh, used so many third-round picks, later picks on guys with ACLs, and they just never panned out. Um, and, um, you, you, this team risks doing that. I mean, that, that it's a tough balance because you're not playing those guys. They have to be good right away, uh, in this day and age. And, and sometimes they aren't, aren't. So, um, I agree with you, uh, Malik Mustafa, I would, uh, add to that list of guys that you just ticked off. Um, I think, uh, bringing up Adam Peters is also interesting. He's the, the Washington commanders, uh, GM right now, the commanders are in rebuilding mode. Um, he's been spending his time getting rid of just about every Ron Rivera <laughs> pick out there. So I, I wonder whether some of these guys, Sam Womack, um, some Danny others, Gray. Danny Gray, Danny Gray. I, I, don't, I, I don't know about Danny Gray. I think, <laughs> I think even, uh, even Peters would concede on that one. Um, it, it wasn't uh, a, a spectacular pick. Uh, but I, I, I wonder how many of those guys will wind up in Washington at least, uh, on practice squads. Who, and who do you like see that. coming back? Eric Sobert's your guy, and they cut him. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm him. I'm slightly less confident about that, but um, as uh, as we know, they're they're going to make some moves on Wednesday. They've got at least two guys um, in um, Ambry Thomas and uh, John Feliciano who are injured uh, long term, you know, multiple months, uh, who made the initial roster. So those guys are going on IR on Wednesday, that'll open up two spots. Still got Trent Williams to worry about, but um, the, the tight end situation to me um, uh, is, uh, is is begging for another body. So I would assume that Salbert, the only other guy on that roster who can block, um, would be one of the guys that they they pick up tomorrow just to, to bolster that a little bit. Um, you know, that was sort of the theme here is that um, you know, Braden Willis had a, a really rough time blocking. And we saw that in the games. They were definitely trying to get Jake Tondras into these games, giving him the opportunity to to win that job. He wasn't a great blocker either, but I think he did better, better than Braden Willis. And he essentially took Willis's spot. Um, and um, they just need that, uh, that other inline blocker. And I, I'm assuming that goes to Saubert unless they've got – another trick up their sleeve, uh, another guy that they want to bring in. I don't think that Logan Thomas is that guy. He's more of a receiver. Blocking is his uh, his Achilles heel. So um, I, I assume it's Saubert, but, uh, boy, not quite as confident about that one as I was uh, maybe a week ago. That was your guy. My guy makes the team. Two, Both of my guys, right? Chris Conley and Curtis Robinson both make the team. Oh, you're uh, you're claiming Curtis Robinson. Well, he was my late right guy. Here? I told I told you two weeks ago he was. I did. You gotta admit that I did tell you two weeks ago. But he's he's making a pretty good combination, and I have to do some little fiddling here with the Wi-Fi. Um, all right, Barrels, lead me through position by position. Let's just kind of go. All right, let's just start with uh, start at the top with quarterback to keep three. Uh, Brock Purdy, Brandon Allen, and Josh Dobbs. What we don't know is who who's the number two and who's the number three there. Um, and um, I don't know if the 49ers need to reveal that. They might tomorrow. Both John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan are talking, but it's not something that they need to reveal until 
they uh, post their inactive list on on Monday. But um, I, I would say it's very close, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if they got some phone calls about both of those guys. Both of those guys look really good on TV in these preseason games. Um, and um, I think the 49ers have to be happy with that position overall. Yeah, I, the one thing I think it had been lot, talked about that you know the, the rule was going to be you can keep the third quarterback on the practice squad and bring him up uh, to be on the roster. But the NFL just voided that like today. Well, so, yeah, we I only mean, found out about that uh, recently, but uh, apparently the, the teams have known about this for okay. a while. Well, I was thought I was thinking, man, they would be like spring the like you build everything based on that, and then oh by the way, you can't do that. Once that rule became public, they were going to keep all three. Like I, I thought they might try to sneak one of those guys through if you can keep on the practice squad and bring him up to be the three. But this team's history at quarterback, <laughs> I don't think they want to do that. They want three quarterbacks they're happy with. If they can do it, they do it. Um, all right. Uh, and yeah, I don't know who, what the order is going to be. I will bring up, interestingly, you say that uh, Lynch and Shanahan are both scheduled to speak. You know, They usually do their pressers together. And they're doing them separate. Maybe it's just to keep Kyle kind of away from the, maybe the negotiation stuff and just get John up there and have John talk about the negotiation stuff. I would guess that's why they're doing that. Yeah, I, I checked in with that. That was my recollection, too, that they're always a, a tandem at these things. But apparently not for the last couple of years, they've done them separately. Even Adam Peters and Lynch did one together two years ago. I'm so okay. Okay. we might be mis misremembering it, but that was my impression too. One, one guy's talking at two, the other at 2.45 tomorrow. Yeah. So definitely uh, two separate uh, press just, you, No, I, I don't think we're misremembering. They rarely have two separate. If, if yeah. John's going to be speaking by himself, Kyle doesn't talk. And so the fact that they're both talking, there is something to it. I'm not saying anything tricky or weird. I'm just saying it's a little different. Uh, and maybe that, that it, Kyle's just sick of talking about how you can trend. I mean, that I, really could be it. I think Tim is obviously saying that there's a uh, Jim Harbaugh, Trent Baalke thing going on now between <laughs> Kyle and John. That's uh, that's how I'm going to take it. The aggregators are going to be wild with this. Not saying that. Next position. Next position. Okay. Next position is running back. We've got Christian McCaffrey, Jordan Mason. No surprises there. But then we've got... Patrick Taylor Jr. and Isaac Grendo as the last two. And then, of course, uh, Kyle Juszczyk as the fullback. Elijah Mitchell goes on injured reserve to begin the season, which means that his season is over. Yeah, without um, with no designation to return. You can't designate to return. He does not have the designation. Exactly. He does not have the designation to return. He was um, dealing with a, a hamstring injury for the second half of training camp. Uh, we did see him yesterday. Early in the practice, didn't see him a whole lot late in the practice. Um, obviously, we'll we'll ask the uh, the two primaries about this tomorrow. But my sense is that something happened in the practice, and that obviously it's something bad. I mean, hamstring doesn't usually um, mean that the guy is lost for the season, but uh, this this obviously is something. Um, serious. The 49ers love Elijah Mitchell. I know that the fans are are lukewarm toward him, but uh, if there's a chance for him to play in 2024, the 49ers would have taken it, and and they're not. So this uh, denotes something very serious. It might maybe you know, and Kyle brings it up himself. Jer Jarek McKinnon, you know, blown out his ACL yeah. week before week one, uh, however long that was. Uh, it was that Shanahan's second season, I think it was. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, we we don't know. Does make it, you know, you've got Christian McCaffrey. I don't, you know, we don't know how hard he can go and practice this week or next week. Uh, we don't know. Is he going to be 100% for the game? We don't know if he could get banged up again. You're a little light there. But yeah. I think, you know, Jordan Mason is, has proven himself. Uh, I think Garendo is interesting. You don't know how long he can stay healthy. But they're light. They're light at running back. And that's a position you want to be super deep. Uh, at least until they know that the Christian McCaffrey is ready to go. And, uh, you know, it's again, we keep saying that they, they got some top, top end talent. Then you start kind of going, we don't know for sure what the depth is. And again, I'll just go a draft class. Isaac Rendo, if they didn't have him, I think Cody Schrader is on that team. And I don't know how great that is. You know what you can really, you know, can he be your third running back on an NFL roster? All right. Next position, Barrows. Yeah, Schrader uh, could end up on the uh, practice squad yeah. at some point. Uh, let's go wide receiver. Went deep at wide receiver. This is a team that sometimes keeps five wide receivers. They've got seven right now. 
Uh, Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel, Juwan Jennings, no surprises there, Ricky Pearsall, Jacob Cowing, Chris Conley, your guy, and yeah. then your anti-guy, Ronnie Bell, uh, is, is the seventh guy. Um, obviously, the Ayuk situation makes this a little dicey. You mentioned it earlier. Pearsall only just coming back from a recurring um, shoulder injury, um, a sublux, as uh, uh, Kyle Shanahan described it. That means that the the shoulder has, you know, either come out partially or fully um, stretching the ligaments, which means that uh, it's more likely to occur again. So that's going to be kind of looming over his rookie season. Um Ronnie Bell, I mean, uh, how much does that surprise you that that he gets that seventh spot? Surprises me. I mean, I'm just trying to think back now that I know that he's on the roster. One, obviously, you don't know about Pearsall and you don't know about Ayuk. I understand you go one extra. He's the one extra. Also, Cowing and Garendo, if they're the, you're for sure your kickoff and you know, Cowing is your punt returner and Garendo is your kickoff returner. Well, they've been hurt, right? I mean, sure. so what if one of them gets hurt? You, who's your other returner? You don't, you know, Trent Taylor's not on the team. Like, I get the fact you just might need someone who you know can return. Put your hand up and fair catch or whatever. I don't think Ronnie Bell's very good at it, but I get, like, if you're going to put all this responsibility on rookies who have been hurt, they have been hurt in camp, you're basing what this Garendo based on what three practices in an exhibition game. And you're basing counting on like five practices and two exhibition games. Like I can see maybe we don't need to sell the whole farm on these two guys. Let's have someone else there just in case Pierce all can punt return. But again, he's hurt too. Do you want him to expose him to that? So I guess I could understand bell on that. I, I think he's a little superfluous, but I understand that part of it. And, you know, you're, you are getting a little, we keep saying that they're a little thin, a returner, and they're counting a lot on injured players, and there could be some more injuries. So I get that part of it for Ronnie Bell. I just don't think he's a very good receiver. Yeah, I, I'm not quite as critical about Ronnie Bell as you are. Um, I, I think that uh, last year he, he showed that he's smart, and he picked up all three positions. Um, that's valuable to have uh, on the roster in case, you know, there's a, uh, a slew of guys at one of those spots who gets injured. Um, he also did uh, a good job as a, a gunner for a stretch of last season. So you, you get a lot of bang for your buck with Ronnie Bell. I get, um, I get Now, you know, that doesn't mean that he's going to be on this roster the whole season. Um, he, they could make a change right there um, and, uh, and, and and put him down onto the practice squad at some point. Um, let's move on to tight end. Not a long list. <laughs> First kiddle, Jake Tonjes. Um, well, let's say, and, why did Tonjes uh, beat out? The other guys. Yeah. Tom just beat out uh, Braden Willis, basically. Um, you, you and Sauber, right? And Sauber. Yeah, for now. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I feel like uh, <laughs> Tom, just, Tom just and Sauber weren't really playing the same position. Um, Tom just was more of that H-back, the guy that they put in the backfield sometimes, which is what Braden Willis was doing, which is why they need that that second in-line blocker, somebody who can do that uh, the way um, – Charlie Warner did it last year in the way, obviously, George Kittle does it. So, obviously, they're going to make some moves there. I mean, there, there were a couple of interesting cuts today. Um, the, the Chargers cut a tight end. Uh, there are some guys on the waiver wire uh, that they might be able to bring in. They're obviously not done at, at tight end. Uh, I appreciate the Barrows uh, argument there, but if they liked uh, Sauber better than Tonjes, they wouldn't have cut. Sauber ahead of because you might lose them, right? If you cut Tonjes, yeah, sure, you, you risk losing Tonjes, and I think they just didn't want to risk. Them. I don't. He's fine, whatever. We'll, we'll see, and and obviously they can bring you know what Pline back on the practice squad, whoever else back on the practice squad. It's just a little weird to go with two on a team that's kept four before, uh, and we know loves playing two tight ends, and they only have two right now. Very interesting, and it's a position that people get hurt. So maybe they're going to go my three wide out thing. Come on, Kyle. Well, that, three that's three that's been brought up. Is uh, yeah. are they going to do more eleven personnel now that they have have two tight ends on the roster? You go ask Kyle that one. I, I'm not going to ask Kyle this time. I got smacked down last time I asked it. So. Well, the other thing we should bring up at tight end is that remember this team tried to sign a restricted free agent from the Lions in the off season, Brock Wright. That was their first choice at tight end, and. The Lions ended up matching. And so Saubert was sort of a, a consolation prize. So, um, again, it's just uh, a lot of uh, a lot of missteps at 
well, it's really an, an important position to the 49ers. I mean, I would think that tight end um, is more important to the 49ers than just about every other team in the league, just given who the head coach is and uh, the way that they run their their offense. So a, a bit peculiar that um, tight end hasn't been emphasized more. Obviously, they they brought in a, a great one in 2017 in George Kittle, but um, just like offensive tackle, that's sort of the theme of this podcast. They haven't really done much since then. Um, Next position. Offensive line. They, they kept eight. Now, there's no Trent Williams on this. Mm-hmm. He's on the reserve did not report list. Uh, right now it's Jalen Moore and Colton McKivitz. Those are the only two tackles. Uh, Aaron Banks, still hurt. Uh, Jake Brendel, Dominic Pooney, Spencer Burford, Nick Zakel, and John Feliciano, who probably isn't going to last very much longer on the uh, active roster because he's dealing with a, uh, a multi-month uh, knee issue. So, um that's that's uh that's that's not a great <laughs> not a great roster given all the guys who are uh, are injured right now um banks uh still out spencer burford did come back he was practicing on um uh, uh on monday but he was practicing behind dominic cooney he's got to be behind him yeah let's just why do you do this uh, you know you have the IR now where you can do it, bring him back without having them make the 53 if you designate them return, which they did with Khalil Davis. We'll talk about that. Why wouldn't they do that for either Feliciano uh, or who else did they do it? Whoever else they did it with. Uh, oh, Ambry Thomas. And what do you get by having them make the 53, then putting them on IR? Well, remember, you only get eight of those a year, the, the designated to return. So Kalia Davis, who is in that category, already burns one of those. Um Obviously, the 49ers feel confident that he's going to be back. He's going to be needed at some point. Um, they're a little bit light along the defensive line. I, I guess they don't have quite the confidence uh, that that Feliciano is going to be back. Um, they've got maybe a little bit better depth there, but uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, you know, they did run out of those designations uh, a few years ago, and so that may have made them then gun-shy um, by putting – Feliciano and Ambry Thomas on IR say on Wednesday, it gives them the option later on to, you know, bring them back or not, depending on, on need. They don't have that option if they do it before the roster cuts or it, uh, it just count, it, already, it already counts. Yeah. I see what you're saying. It already counts and you're saving spots for someone who might get hurt early in the season and you want to bring him back later in the season. There that's you right. go. That's, that's what it is. Okay. I was trying to figure that out. Uh, yeah, really light. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I got to believe I mean, they cut Jarrett Kingston and Drake Nugent. And I figured one of them was making this team. Uh, maybe they come back when Feliciano goes down. It just again, we, we're going over this. They seem light on tackle and see and in the middle. It's like rare to be light in the middle and on the outside on the offensive line. Um, does feel like they feel like Trent Williams is coming back. But we'll see that and believe, you know, when it happens. and. Man, they get a rush of injuries. They've already got two guards hurt, Burford and and, and Banks, and you got a rookie at starting at right guard. Like, there's a lot of possible things that could go wrong there. Uh, but this is what they've set up. They clearly have not invested a lot in the offensive line. They have enunciated that as a th- way they do it. It isn't by accident, and we'll see how this how they make it through. It's just uh, they are asking for a lot of things. The way Shanahan says it, it's just like, you know, it's cover your ass. Just keep on drafting offensive linemen high. Nobody ever rips you. And they're not going to do it that way. They're going to try to get playmakers uh, high in the draft and make do with whatever they can on the offensive line. Uh, it's a theory. I get it. I don't subscribe to it myself, but I get it. And if you're going to go with it, go with it as best you can. And that's what they're doing. You know, uh, they're, they're light at center, too. They've got Jake Brendel as their starter. He's in his 30s. Um, the guy right behind him is Nick Zakel. He, he's not battle tested at all. Yep. Played it, played it for him. Um, and then after that, maybe you get, um, you know, uh, that rookie Drake Nugent onto the practice squad. That's not a guarantee at this point, but that's, that's your center situation. Um, John Feliciano was playing a little center in the spring. So, um, if he does come back, he would probably be the, uh, the top backup at both center and guard once he's fully healthy. But again, we don't, we don't know exactly when that's going to be. So yeah, they're, they're, they're dicey at a couple of spots. 
they hadn't drafted Dominic Pooney in the third round, uh, this, this would be a, a real uh, kind of uh, disaster zone for them. I was going to try to do what would they be like now if they didn't have their 2024 20, draft class. It's just too hard. There's too many different pieces. But like if they didn't have Pony, if they didn't have Cowing, they didn't have Grant, they wouldn't have kickoff returner, punt returner, starting right guard. <laughs> like that's a lot. Maybe I should have done that. But I think you could project they've just got these guys in really important roles. And if they didn't have them, I don't know what they'd be doing. I mean, it, it would be really, really difficult to imagine this roster without the 2024 class. Not that they're stars but that they're just important right away, which means that they could be good down the road or they should be getting better and better. Now they're older rookies, but they're still rookies. They're NFL rookies. All right. Yeah. Defense. There are some 24, 25 year old rookies in that class. Um, defensive line. Nick Bosa made the team. That's good. Javon Hargrave, uh, Malik Collins, Leonard Floyd, Yatura Gross Matos, Kevin Gibbons, Jordan Elliott, Robert Beal Jr., and Sam Okayinanu. Oka there you go, my guy. I practiced that, and I still botched it. Uh, um, so uh, Sam, I'm going to call him Sam O for the, <laughs> the sake of this. Um, I, I think he's there for insurance right now. They, they don't quite know whether Gross Matos is going to be available for the Jets game. Remember, both uh, Leonard Floyd and Gross Matos had knee sprains in that game, back-to-back -back plays. Uh, they're not worried about Leonard Floyd. He should be back at practice next week. Or the uh, the run up to the Jets game, not so sure about Gross Motto. So I think uh, Oka Yinanu would be there if um, if uh, Gross Motto is not. Yeah, they definitely seem to like have an extra defensive end. Uh, and the other thing I look at is like they're counting on Robert Beal. I mean, he just looks like he's the third or fourth defensive end, and that's a pretty big role. We know that, you know he's basically Drake Jackson, and we keep going to failed draft picks of the recent past. Drake Jackson is an injury you know, out for the year. And I don't know when or if he's ever going to, you know, be anything. And we know that th those defensive ends need snaps off and they are important players in the third quarter. You see it, tough game. There's the third defensive end there playing five snaps at a time. Uh, and it's Robert Beal. Um, and we'll see. I think he's got some talent, but we'll see. Uh, it, it would be better for them if he had proven more. But again, we keep going back to this these draft choices who haven't done much and they, they do, do need to see something out of them. Um, and I think the secondary is better than the defensive line. And it's the first time I felt that way in the Shanahan Lynch era. I, there's a possibility that these guys are good. I think Leonard Floyd is very talented, a uh, very consistent player, but it's not like D four. It's not like, you know, they got another DeForest Buckner in there. It's not like they've got Eric Armstead in his prime. They maybe you get a better year out of Javon Hargrave, who was fine last year, but not great. But man, it's just not like the same. It's not the same four hour defensive line that we're used to. Like we could see it in training camp, right? It wasn't overwhelming the offense. At times it was very good, but it was a secondary that seemed to be the toughest thing for the offense to deal with. It's just very different. I don't think it's on purpose, right? I mean, John Lynch is never going to purposely weaken the defensive line. But the things they've done, I mean, I think specifically it's the Drake Jackson pick and the Javon Kinlaw pick have not really borne out. And they've hit more on the secondary. The secondary is just the, the Amador Lenore. I think Jair Brown's going to be a real solid player. They, they're they hitting more on the secondary, and that's why the secondary is better right now. Yeah. Um, uh, just look at all the work they've done on the D-line over the years, and yet it's still light. Um, that defensive end spot – uh, you know, they, I think they realized how, obviously they realized how light it was last year. They made two trades at midseason for it. And so they, they did some work in the, in the off season. Um, and yet here we are, you know, kind of talking about, uh, guys that you're just really only now reading about who made this roster, um, and who could, who could play against the Jets. Oh, yeah. oh question. So, um, yeah, that's an, that's, uh, that's enough. That's going to be, you know, they, they need to have good luck at that position this year. Um, and uh, boy, that uh, that game against the Raiders the, the other night that that could have been a death knell for the season. But they're Las lucky. Vegas not real good for the health of 49ers defenders or defensive yeah. coaches or defensive coaches either. That's either. true. That's true. <laughs> um, let's move on to linebacker. They kept six: Fred Warner, Devondre Campbell. Those are your starters against the Jets, and then. Demetrius Flanagan fouls. I think I've said this before. When they make their 53-man roster. They don't put Brock Purdy's name first. They don't put <laughs> Nick Bosa's. They put Demetrius Flanagan Fowles' name first. He always makes the roster. 
Uh, so he makes it. Your guy, Curtis Robinson, makes mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. D. Winters makes it. Tatum Bethune makes it. The guy who didn't make it is Jalen Graham, who basically was last year's Tatum Bethune. And Bethune, I thought in that uh, in that Raiders game, just just outplayed him. Um, Bethune was was everywhere. He was aggressive. He was making plays along the line of scrimmage. Uh, I don't think that um, Graham had a bad game, a bad preseason, but um, this 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 rookie just came and took that spot. Yeah, you know, I think I might have made some points. I just think the coaches have been kind of down on Graham from about the end of training camp last year on, and it was going to be tough for him to be better than D. Winters, and it was only going to be one spot for the two of them. And D. Winters is better. I don't think D. Winters is great. We've kind of gone over it and maybe overrun some plays, but I think he just does more stuff. I think they just think of him in a higher regard than they do Jalen Graham, and I just think you know they were going to go for a younger player. Uh, they weren't going to have both those guys on the roster. And Bethune is the younger player that, and Robinson's a security blanket, as you mentioned. Uh, Demetrius Flanagan Fowles is a all-time security blanket, special teams guy, and can play middle linebacker and can play strong side linebacker, and those are just so important for them, especially while Greenlaw's out. Like, just can they count on someone to hold the edge? Can they count on someone to go defend that? You know, that running back coming out of the backfield, maybe not great, but no, don't do it in a in a horribly mis a mistaken way and those two those two guys those veterans really do it and do you need both you know maybe not if green lost back but while he's out i think it just makes them feel better that they have that taken care of that position has some veterans on it and they couldn't have jalen graham there and not and oh not curtis robinson it just wasn't the way this this team thinks about it uh how long this will go on for both of them i don't know <laughs> but on this year's team they're going to be on. You should look at – it's my old thing. I t t I talk about it with Barros all the time. Let's look at who's playing on the first line special teams. And if there's a linebacker playing on both coverage units, punt and kickoff, it's probably going to make the team. And that's what that's what happened. Beal was on all those teams. And um, Winters was on all, all those teams. And Robinson was on all those teams. And Flanagan Fowles was on all those teams. So those are the guys. Yeah, that's how um, uh, we, we picked that one right in our projection because Flanagan Fowles started the game at at, uh, at linebacker and uh, your guy Robinson was on all the uh, special teams units, uh, especially early in the game. So the, the handwriting was on the wall on that one. Uh, let's move on to cornerback. They, they kept six. They kept five at this point last year. So six um you know uh speaks to just how deep that position was and they got rid of a couple of good guys too the guys that they're keeping are Charvarius Ward, Diamondor Lenore, Isaac Yadam those are probably your top 3 this year although they haven't quite handed that number 3 job to to Yadam and I think uh, Renardo Green is still in the mix there then comes Renardo Green uh another one of your your rookie all-stars here um, Darrell Luter Jr. He's a, a member of the the 23 class, and Ambry Thomas. Ambry Thomas uh, won't be there for long. He'll get moved. And so the guys that they cut were Rocky Sin, who I thought was just as consistent as as anybody in camp, uh, sort of a, a battle tested veteran. I actually remember him going against Debo Samuel uh, at the Senior Bowl in, in Mobile, Alabama, in, in 2019. Uh, those were two of the best players in that game. Um, and then the other ones are Samuel Molmack and um, Chase Lucas uh, were cut. So any combination of those guys could end up back on the practice squad. Rocky Sin could even end up uh, on the active roster at some point this year if they have another another injury. Yeah, deep deep position, good position. The fact that you can say maybe the last four, you know, the two last two on and, and, the, and the first two out are pretty interchangeable. That's pretty good. Like, you know, it goes to the, in the years they're playing, you know, pulling Jake, Dre Kirkpatrick out and he, Josh Norman and they're starting. It was not that long ago. And now they've got depth. They've got veteran. They've got young players. Now we'll see, with, you know, with the free agencies coming up for Ward and Lenore, but uh, this is a good position for them. Like this is really a comfortable spot to be at cornerback. And I think – we were throwing our arms up, you know, several years ago. Like, why aren't you drafting quarterbacks? Why aren't like this is a an important position and they weren't doing it? We recently have been saying that about offensive line, but they've been doing it at cornerback. So maybe it's a push pull, maybe it's an either or, but at a very important position in this 
in football these days, cornerback, I think they are built very well. They're built, it feels like they're sort of built like the Chiefs were last year. You know, the strength in the corners, strength, you know, in the secondary. And, you know, you try to make do with it. You know, they got, they had Chris Jones, but they didn't have great linebackers, good linebackers, not great ones. And you try to make do, and then you put some talent on the outside to stop the other teams from making big plays. Uh, that's clearly not just that, but the 49ers have not really been that. And they're definitely trending that way with this group. Yeah. I mean, we've been criticizing them about some uh, other positions, but cornerback, they, they, they made some, they made two really good moves there. They, they brought in Charvarius Ward and free agency um, before he was a superstar. They saw a guy that they thought was ascending, who was going to get better and better with time. And they were right on that. I, I think that he's to the point where, you know, we're talking about him being one of the top five cornerbacks in the league this year. Uh, and he wasn't that when they got him uh, a couple of years ago. And then of course, uh, Diamador Lenore is one of their, Famous fifth rounders, um, uh, who's just uh, just so feisty, um, savvy, doesn't overthink things, um, just what you want, um, can play any of those three positions. So um, two really strong moves, and that's why it's uh, perhaps the deepest uh, position on the team this year. Um, at safety, they ended up keeping four. This was a surprise to me because Talano Hufanga has yet to practice yeah. for this team. Here we are 13 uh, days out from um, the uh, the opener and Hufanga, who suffered a ACL tear on November 19. So hasn't had the, the full year yet, uh, but they are obviously feeling good enough about Hufanga not to keep him on PUP to begin the season, which would have made sure that he didn't play in any of the first four games. Um, I'm still not sure about week one against the Jets. Uh, but uh, I think it speaks to, you know, their um, their thoughts about Hufanga, uh, obviously encouraged by what he's been doing on the field. And it probably also speaks to some of the other guys there that uh, they want him in there sooner rather than later. Um, if Hufanga didn't start, it would be Jair Brown, who we've talked about, and then George Odom, uh, who I thought had uh, a really good training camp. Um, he was hurt in this Raiders game. I don't think that that's um, part of this equation, but maybe it just kind of reminded them that, boy, we've got George Odom. He plays a lot of special teams. Um, he's also our starting safety. So uh, there's a, a pretty good chance that he gets beat up in one of these games that happened last year. Um, so um, that may have been part of the uh, the calculus on, on the safety moves. Who was that cornerback that kept bringing back and he tears ACL and he bring him back again? Uh, God, just recently, uh, the free agent cornerback from the Chargers. You know the guy. I, I'm blanking. Mark Taylor. No, no, the cornerback who like they they signed and they put him in the game and he got hurt again. They had to take him right back out. Remember that guy? God. I can't remember. I'll I'll think of it afterwards. I shouldn't try to Google it right now. It's it, you'll remember him. It's the cornerback they kept and it, they're over optimistic about him. Oh, yeah. yeah. You now, know, now you've now yeah. you, uh, Jason Verrett. Jason Verrett. Oh my God, I'm blanking. You, out. you, you are predicting a Jason Verrett. No, 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 no. Return. I'm not predicting. I am not predicting. I'm oh, just man, saying. The aggregators are going to have a field day with this. It podcast. reminds There's me so of, many juicy tidbits in it. It's like an Easter egg. You have optimism because they love, right? They love Jason Verrett, right? They loved him, still love him. They would still have him on this team if they could possibly have it. They love Talanoa Hofunga for good reasons. Incredible guy. Really good player has not practiced yet, right? I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, there is so much optimism on this, and it seems to be over optimistic to me. Uh, and you know, put that might have been the more, uh, you know, safer way to go. It absolutely would have been a safer way to go. Okay, it just reminds me of that. Um, God keep this guy off of Astro Turf as long as possible. I mean, they're, what they're playing the Vikings in week two. And we saw what happened with Rhett whenever he was on Astro Turf. It was terrible. So anyway, that just I'm just reminded of that. I'm not saying that's what's gonna happen. I'm just that's the last time I can remember them just kind of pushing a guy out there just because of for vibes, uh, maybe before he's even hit the practice field. Okay. Now I'm, well, you got me um, on the negative. That, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. Turf week two, turf week three, too. They're playing the Rams uh, in week three. So two of the first four games are, are going to be on artificial surfaces. Maybe maybe that should be part of the calculus uh, as well. 
Um, I'll just finish up with the specialists, Jake Moody, uh, Mitch Wisnowski, and Tabor Pepper. And also, as you noted, um, probably two rookies uh, in the return roles. And, and that's, um, that's, that's gutsy. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I will say that every time um, Kyle Shanahan's asked about Jacob Cowling, he notes that he looks yeah. comfortable looks secure doing the punts. And, and I think that's, that was a big part of it. Yes. You want the, uh, the good returns, which he's done as well, but uh, he's made it look, I don't want to say it made it look easy, but um, he, he's not overwhelmed by it. There are not a lot of flubs in practice. And by the way, there's some other guys that are doing that. Danny Gray was one of them. <laughs> there are a lot of flubs. Uh, so the, the two guys who are the most secure with the ball in the practices have been Trent Taylor and Jacob Cowling. We've just seen a lot more of Taylor than we have Cowling. So it's it's a, it's a little bit of a leap of faith in that regard. And then uh, we've got Garendo on, on kickoffs, and everybody saw what he did uh, in Las Vegas. And, and that's part of the reason why they, they, they brought him in. Uh, they thought he could be their kick returner right away, and it looks like he's going to get a chance to be that against the Jets. I will say with Cowling, we can see him in practice. It's a, it's a whole different thing. You put somebody in the stadium, you know, night game, Balls up in the lights. You have the crowd, the noise. It's bigger. I've seen guys who can't do it in in stadiums, and Cowling has looked actually better, I think, in stadiums. Like he's like feeling like he's in the play, uh, and that's a big deal. Does not mean you know, we know for sure he can do it in games, but I, I just think he looks great. Just catching the ball, getting six yards. Catching the ball, getting eleven yards. Catching the ball does you know not running backwards, not bobbling the ball. Uh, that's the, my thing with Ronnie Bell. It's like he just bobbled it like too many times. Like, is, that, is he gonna fall? Okay, no, he's still got. It. Okay, wait a minute. Uh, how many times? Like after the play, the ball will come out. Like, was that a fumble or not a fumble? Cowling hasn't done that again. Don't know if that's the way it's always gonna be, but I, I think he's a pretty secure uh, returner, which obviously only adds roster value. And Garendo, that one kickoff, I, I was talking to you about it. I was gonna write about it. Uh, like you just haven't seen a 49er returner get past the 50. It's like, when's the last time they got all the way down that far? 93 yard return. He didn't get in the end zone, but he goes down inside the 10. Um, and it was a long Trenton Castle, like 68 yarder, the 2021 early season against the Packers. But then I real I looked it up, and uh, our guy Ray Ray had a 50, like 56 yarder in the playoffs against the Cowboys in 2022. So that kind of messed up my entire note. I threw it all out because I, my whole premise was you never see this on the 49ers. I know I've never seen it. Let me look it up. It was Trenton Castle and Cannon. I was Trenton Cannon. That's so bad. Yeah. Who's Trent? Trent, Trent Castle, I think is an NBA player. Uh, so oops. I even sent Barros the video of it. I was so excited. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. It really made his day. Well, right, can I can I challenge you with a uh, a trivia oh, question? Oh, here we go. Here we can go. Can you name the the last two 49ers who have returned a punt and a kickoff for touchdowns? Uh, wasn't it that Ted Ginn? Yes. Was punt return? That's the punter, that was 2011. That was the uh, first game. Yeah. Season opener, yeah. Yep. He, he had uh, he had two. Kick or at least he had there. he had uh, two big returns, one of yeah. which was a touchdown. Yep, ninety one or something. There was like some massive one, and uh, kickoff was longer than that, I believe. No, it no. wasn't. I think it was eight twenty eighteen. Mm. They yeah. they um, have the longest remember. drought for a punt return touchdown in yep. the league. Yep, um, they I haven't even been close. close. They haven't even been close. No. It's no. like they don't even break that first line. It's six yards, <laughs> and that's what they get. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't tell you who, who it's, it is. uh, it's Richie James. Uh, oh, that's also, a good one. also against the, uh, the Seahawks. That was, a I think it was a Sebastian Janikowski kickoff where he just gave up. He was like the last line of defense. <laughs> he was playing for the, the Seahawks at that point. And, uh, it was one of the worst efforts I've ever seen from somebody who's expected to at least make a, a tackle attempt. Ebass not giving effort on tackle. Shocking. <laughs> yeah, shocking. He may have been 52 years old at that time. So I'm not, I'm <laughs> not sure. 314 pounds. Uh, and as I was looking up this postseason, guess where Ricky, Richie James comes up uh, very recently. He was oh, I don't re- know. Kick returner for the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Did not. Oh, yeah, of course. Did not return. There were no re- no kickoff returns in that game, but he was the returner. And I uh, there was like one punt return. It was a very, very uh, nondescript special teams game, but. There you go. The kick. That's why they changed the kickoff rules. Just be, it was cited like they had no kickoff returns in the Super Bowl. 
uh, not a great wasted play in, in football. And we will get kickoff returns this year. All right, Barrows, we've done it. Gone through the roster. I like it. Yeah, 45 minutes. This is long for us. 45 minutes, and I only had to cha- you know, flick on the Wi-Fi two or three times. But uh, uh, I, earlier today, I had a, a laptop disaster at the end of my podcast with Dave Fleming. So I, I definitely have to be more active. My laptop just shut off. Have you had that one with my laptop before? It just shut no, off. No, not yet. I, I can't yeah. wait. <laughs> yeah, battery power goes from like 52% to 0% in about three seconds. So I have to be very aware of that. Uh, but we've survived. All right, Barrows. I'll see you down there. All right. Sounds good. That's the show for today.